was just a little kid My friends and I'd play war We'd shoot them dead and blow them up Didn't know what we were fighting for The East Memorial stressed the tremendous importance of who we elect as President, Commander-in-Chief, and for that matter, who we elect to the House of Representatives in Congress, because it's Congress, according to the Constitution, not the President, that decides when we go to war, when we send our troops into harm's way. These officers have tremendous responsibility. We as voters, then, have a tremendous responsibility in electing the very best people uh, that we can to these positions of high responsibility. Just going back briefly to my service in the Marines, I was an enlisted man, and no offense to the colonel, but we had a, a saying among enlisted men that the highest rank you can ever achieve in the military is civilian. Um, that was generally said uh, somewhat in jest when we we're having a beer and uh, you know thinking about the day we're gonna get out of the military. Uh, but I think that that saying has truth that goes beyond just that setting. When the framers of our Constitution, the founders of our country, set up the Constitution. They didn't make it so that a military general would be commander-in-chief. They made it so they wrote the Constitution though, so that a civilian elected official, uh, whether with or without past military experience, would be the commander-in-chief of the United States Armed Forces. And they gave a Congress elected by civilian the power to raise and support an army and the power to declare war. The founders of our country knew from the history of war in Europe that if you have a standing military controlled by a military general, all too often they're going to find something to do other than maintaining the peace. They wanted our country to be run by a civilian leader, not a military general, so it would not be a, a military a dictatorship. So that phrase, um, the highest rank you can ever achieve in the military as a civilian is not just one that we use in jest, but in fact it's written into our Constitution. The highest rank in the United States military, the rank of Commander-in-Chief, is an office that we as civilians elect. Both John F. Kennedy and Dwight Eisenhower understood the realities of war. And they were very cautious in how they exercised their, their power as commanders-in-chief. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower said, every warship that is launched, every gun that is made, every rocket that is fired represents, in the final sense, a theft from those who are hungry and not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. And when Eisenhower stepped down as president after his second term in 1960, he warned about the rise of the military-industrial complex and the potential for what he called a disastrous uh, influence of the military-industrial and complex on our democracy. So even though he was a war hero himself, he was well aware of the need for civilian control uh, of the military. Uh, similarly, John F. Kennedy uh, said, after he came back from World War II, he was reporting on the founding of the United Nations in San Francisco in 1945. And he wrote back to a friend, war will exist until that day when the conscious subjector enjoys the same reputation and prestige as the warrior does today. John F. Kennedy was encouraged by the Joint Chiefs of Staff to provide military support for the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961, which was a disaster. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, he was again encouraged by the Joint Chiefs of Staff to launch a preemptive military strike. Had he done that, we might not be standing here today. We might well have been involved in a nuclear war with the Soviet Union that may have ended human civilization as we knew it. But he had the experience and the wisdom to know when to stand up uh, to the military chief, and he settled that conflict uh, diplomatically. We have an entirely different president now, George W. Bush who fancies himself as a war hero. Um, even though it's been aptly pointed out that the closest he ever got to Vietnam in a military uniform was when he did that infamous landing on the USS Abraham Lincoln and spread it across the uh, deck in the flight suit to say that uh, basically the war in Iraq was ended under that banner of uh, mission accomplished. In comparing then John McCain 
and Senator Barack Obama. Uh, why do I as a veteran and the other veterans here support uh, Barack Obama over John McCain? The first thing I want to say, I want to reiterate comments that General Wesley Clark made in that now uh, infamous uh, interview on Face the Nation when he was quoted out of context. His main thrust uh, during that interview was to say how he honored John McCain for being a true hero and an inspiration to millions of veterans for his courage while he was a prisoner of war uh, in a North Vietnamese uh, prisoner of war camp. And I share that. I honor John McCain for that. I respect him uh, for his courage. I also respect John McCain for coming out and saying about waterboarding, waterboarding is an exquisite form of torture. Uh, he was right on, and he should know, because he was tortured as a prisoner of war. But in other areas, John McCain has disappointed me, and Barack Obama has impressed and inspired me. And I'm going to talk about two specific issues. The first is the U.S. invasion of Iraq. I believe that John McCain, as a, as a Vietnam combat veteran, should well have seen the parallels between the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution and the resolution for the authorization of force in Iraq. Both resolutions passed on false pretenses. In the case of the Gulf of Tonkin, false pretense being that the United States destroyer had been attacked by North Vietnamese torpedo boats, an incident that was later shown not to have happened. In the case of the invasion of Iraq, a false pretense that we had good intelligence that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, when in fact much of that intelligence was if not cooked, at least only one aspect of it uh, was stressed. And also the false pretense that Iraq had anything to do with the September 11 terrorist attacks. John McCain capitulated to politics and voted for the resolution. Barack Obama had the political courage and the good sense to oppose that resolution. And I think of Barack Obama may have been inspired at the time by the words of another great African-American leader, Martin Luther King, who said, wars are poor chisels for carving out peaceful tomorrows. Senator McCain had said, you know, waterboarding is an exquisite form of torture, and yet, he again capitulated partisan politics and voted for the Military Commissions Act, which basically revoked the right of habeas corpus, that is the right to a prompt, uh, fair trial for people being held at Guantanamo Bay and other similar detention facilities in Afghanistan and Iraq, and which basically gave the President of the United States the authority to decide what is and what is not torture. Barack Obama had the good sense and the political courage to vote against the Military Commissions Act. And he made a stirring speech on the floor of the Senate saying that this is being passed out of political expediency, it violates the U.S. Constitution, it violates the Geneva Convention, it violates the principle of habeas corpus, which was established well back at the founding or at the signing of the Magna Carta, and which is at the basis of the American justice system. So again, when you're elected president and commander in chief, you're given the responsibility to defend the United States Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. John McCain did not he capitulated to partisan politics. Barack Obama stood firm and did defend the Constitution of the United States and basic principles of morality and decency. And that's another reason why I and I think all the veterans here today support Barack Obama as the best choice for the President of the United States and their Commander-in-Chief of the United States Armed Forces. It's an honor for me to be asked to speak here. Uh, it's an honor for me to be running for Congress at this, in this historic uh, election. And it would be uh, a tremendous honor to serve in the United States House of Representatives during the administration of President Barack Obama. Thank you.